Hi everyone, um, I'm Adrien Tetard. Uh, it's nice to be here in London. Um, so, um, I come from a scientific background and it's mainly uh, the use of LaTeX that uh, prompted me to go into tag design two years ago. Um, but the tools will always be a problem for me. Um, two weeks after entering tag design, I um, I joined the FontForge uh, development team and um, over the course of 2014 we did a lot of work to um, fix uh, many stability issues and stuff um, and, and there were many um, basic things that were uh, crashing at the time so um, yeah there was a lot of work to bring stability and to bring uh, support for the year for free font format um, but for me, um, there was always a crash behind the crash, and there was a huge C package that was uh, almost impossible to maintain, uh, a non-standard and rather inconvenient UI, um, so I decided to um, work on a replacement. Um, so so while I saw quite a few people complaining about FontForge, um, it looked like um, not many people were actually considering working on a replacement from the ground up. Um, was it out of respect for the 600 giga of a FontForge, which implement everything on top of C? Um, I don't know, but um, the original author stepped down in 2012 after over 12 years of working on it uh, almost every day, and um, it, it, always, uh, it always was uh, rather hard to uh, keep, maintaining the, keep maintaining the software. So here's me uh, um, explaining like uh, what are the issues with FontForge um, because even in the professional tag design community um, it was it was often the case that people told me oh but you don't you don't have uh, OS ten you don't have the font editor but you have FontForge so yeah I kind of I kind of had to uh, like explain uh, what were the issues I, I found both as a user and developer of FontForge. So as soon as September 2014, um, I started working on a replacement. Um, this pull request was uh, the first step in my journey, um, working with Qt and PyQt to be accurate. Um, so here's the actual content of that PR. Um, it's basically adding what's called a pen. And a pen is a way to transfer like contour data between different representations. And here, what it's doing is taking the data from the backend and drawing it into the QPainterPath object, which is the QT, QT object for for Bezier um, path. So once once you got that, you can draw it on screen. So like every clip in font goes through that pen first before being drawn on screen. Um, but of course, you can do much more with the pen protocol because it's a way to stream your data and you can also do uh, modifications to the contour. So for those who were at my workshop, we did um, we saw the remove of curve pen, which uh, simply calls the line to function when from the curve function. But you can do uh, many elaborate things with pen. So here, here it was my first running result that I then sent to Dave Crossland of uh, Google Fonts. Um, They've been trying to talk me into making something with web technologies or uh, using the Python interface of FontForge uh, with PyQt to kind of extend the thing instead of uh, rebuilding something. Um, so both of these uh, were a no-go for me um, because uh, especially the FontForge solution because it would still not address uh, most of the problem. We still have FontForge and the Python interface of FontForge which also uh, is subject to bugs sometimes. Um, so it's in April 2015 that I started working full time on what would become TrueFont, and it released on October of that year. So at the time, back, back in 2014, um, I looked into the UFO file format, which is the basis of the RoboFont editor. So here you have um, a glyph file, so um, it's one of the properties of UFO that it's uh, human readable and editable. 
And compared to binary file format, when it's corrupt, you can actually see the data and edit it. The UFO is also meant as a kind of interchange format between various applications. So there is a standardization of, of um, the most common elements like kerning, um, cliff data of course, uh, layers and so on. And then each, uh, each application can put its own data into either the font lib or you can also put your uh, app files into the data folder. And um, this app you have, um, you have also lib entries into uh, each glyph uh, file, <coughs> so you can store, let's say, hint data. So the UFO had gradually, yeah, the UFO had, gra had gradually spun out from FontLab and its scripting APIs. Um, that was the <coughs> RoboFab library. Um, it's worth noting that the next-gen font editors, those who released it in 2012 for RoboFont and 2011 for Glyphs, were both made by type designers turned developers. So, um, at first, UFO version 1 was a sort of format for uh, use and export from into FontLab and scripting APIs. And it was mirroring the capabilities of uh, FontLab scripting, but then it, it turn into its own, its own thing. Um, and with the release of RoboFont in 2010, which was entirely written in Python, um, the gap between uh, scripting and the main application was becoming almost seamless. So the UFO specification was uh, primarily maintained by Tandemi, who also released some variable tools that are at the basis of RoboFont and also his own software. Um, so, there's the idea of sharing the groundwork that's common to all font applications. Uh, so you can focus on actually making your app instead of dealing with making a file format, making a backend, making a notification system. So, DevCon, uh, you can see here, provides all of that. It's a backend, so it gives you all the font and glyph objects so you can actually uh, have your data in code. Um, it also gives you uh, a notification system to like refresh widgets when the data is changing and it gives you a representation factory system that allows you to cache all representation of your objects because otherwise it, it takes a lot of time to draw on the screen. Um, so, so I kind of wondered like why didn't anyone try to make something out of this? Um, I mean it's all Libra here. Um, so here is uh, Tao's website, and so the larger goal of UFO was to make uh, maintenance easy by splitting the layers of functionality into individual packages, which were each maintained by different people. Um, so because these guys, these guys were not developers by trade, they were um, designers who at some point felt the need to build their own tools. Um, it's for quite an obvious reason that I myself went to type design, I guess. So, right, we, we've got the history, so let's talk about truth on itself. Um, so first, uh, the download numbers. So here, as you can see, um, OS 10 is still like uh, most of the downloads. Um, so uh, 3030 really was uh, make only, it's, it's, it's what are no numbers for the other platforms. But let's say when someone's complaining about um, um, this OS 10, this uh, widget looking uh, weird in OS 10, I can't really ignore it. So yeah, keep in mind those numbers are just the binary downloads, so it's hard to track like all uh, precise numbers. So here we have uh, the uh, object model of the application. So between the UFO and the user, we first have a library called UFO Lib that reads and writes UFO and validates the data. Then you have DEFCON, which provides you all the objects and, and various uh, uh, facilities to, to uh, various backend uh, facilities, like I said before. Um, and then you have the DEFCON QT package, which provides all the base widgets uh, to use in uh, DEFCON and QT applications, uh, regardless of the application. So it's a refactoring that I did out of the TrueFont package. So you have all the 
widgets and things you may use for your app. So it's always this idea of um, shared layers of functionality, and only the last block is uh, specific to the app. Also, um, we have uh, quite a few supporting packages. For instance, um, the Boolean operations package was made by the Robofund author, and if all, uh, if all like uh, open sourcing it, because Boolean operations is like is not a, a feature that's specific to uh, an application. So it can be shared between people, and the maintenance can be shared as well. Uh, likewise, we have quite a few packages. Um, for instance, uh, UFO to FT and phone tools are maintained by Google. Um, some other packages uh, are maintained by Tallaming. So there are actually quite a few parts of TrueFont that I, I don't need to like, maintain myself, so to speak. So I still, I still need it to, to put out a few packages to get them to work. And Font Tools is a library that's uh, useful for uh, dumping binary da data into text. And it also has uh, a lot of uh, useful little tools and things that you will use in all your font applications. So it's kind of, it's kind of uh, here all the time if you're doing uh, a font application. So um, this is what makes uh, TrueFont uh, a lean application, uh, it's, uh, we re-implement the list, so we, we try to share uh, blocks of functionality with uh, other applications. Um, I don't try to make a fancy UI or anything, we just use the uh, native UI of the widget kit. Um, then we implement the list, where we, we just provide a, a set of core functionality that's going to be used by all the users, and then we allow customization, that's the third point. So everyone can write their own plugins, which will then be maintained by those people and not by the true font people. So it's always uh, this idea of uh, modularity and sharing the functionality. Um, also, I may say, um, the initial goal of true font is, is um, mainly to display and edit all the parts of the UFO and not much more than that, which we which will lead to extensions. Um, ex especially stuff which is a little, I call magic, uh, which is processing data uh, according to an, an arbitrary algorithm, let's say to set up your metrics automatically or stuff, this is left to extensions, such that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't blow in your, in your head if, you, if, you, if you're not uh, willing to use it. So here we have uh, the object model of the RoboFed library, which is actually a precursor to DEF CON. Um, because RoboFab is like a high-level library, and DEFCON was made later as a lower-level library that could be used as the basis for um, font software. So DEFCON is little different than that. Uh, we don't have B points or special segment objects. The segments are just list of points. And then we have, uh, of course, uh, a layer object uh, coming out from the font, so you can actually fetch from different layers. Um, but basically, uh, that's what gives you access to all the objects in scripting. For instance, you can iterate over the font to have all your glyphs uh, looped in, and then you can do you can do uh, automated treatments of, of the, the data in your font. So, demo time. So here, for instance, um, I've got the uh, extension I call, uh, <coughs> oops, okay, I shall, I shall restart the app. Time if someone has questions. <laughs> you 
mentioned that you want to keep a lot of functionality and extensions. Um, so there's sort of, that sort of implies that a true font as, uh, as an editor in itself will be rather compact and, and lean, as you almost literally, met, literally mentioned. Um, but for end users, of course, some features are quite nice to have, like auto kerning and stuff like that. You get most of the kerning right to begin with, and so you, so you can fine tune it later on. Um, and I'm aware this is more like a future thing, but are you considering basically shipping some of the well-tested scripts in the base package of Truefound then at some point? Even if there's still extensions, right? But just shipping them as a convenience. Have yes, so, that? so there might be a sort of batteries included approach. Um, maybe not for auto kerning because uh, many people don't don't, don't use that uh, because you don't you don't exactly control like all the outputs and stuff. But yeah, basically, uh, if there are some very core extensions which are not um, like required for editing the stuff but are like very much useful, um, they they may be yeah, included in the default binary distribution of true form. Yeah. Thank you. So, if it works, I'll show you. So it's actually stuff I presented at the workshop. It's always showing the neighbors extension. So, the neighbors extension, we put uh, uh, glyph names here, and they are drawn on the size of the, the glyph in the glyph view. So how, how that works is uh, the, the, the clip view widget here, it sends notification when it draws. And so what we are doing with this widget here is we're subscribing to the, this notification. And when we get that, we also get the painter object, which is the QT object to draw on screen. And when we do that, we, when we come here, uh, we can draw our own uh, content, custom content on the widget. So that's how it works. And basically, uh, in Qt, you have a main object that's called Q application, and it's the parent of all objects which you can access all the time. And so we store a, an event uh, dispatcher into that object. And so you can subscribe or remove your subscription uh, just by taking this application object and calling the appropriate function. Um, also, um, there is a, the other way you may access the glyph view is by writing a tool. You can write custom tool, tools and you have a install tool function. Um, so for instance, here, here this extension is uh, subclassing the selection tool, the one that was a rectangle, uh, except it's drawing a path and it's selecting the points that are in the path. So actually here we can subclass the selection tool and for the moving points functionality we just let the base tool do its thing and we only override the uh, rectangle selection thing. So those are the two ways you may access glyph view and otherwise you get many notifications uh, from the font like when it's saved, when, when a font is opened um, and, and you may do things like so here, for instance, we are listing all the open fonts, and if I open another font, so, open the ball wave, few seconds. So you can see here it appeared on the list because we are subscribing to the font opened notification. So when the font is open, we add it to the list. And so what this extension is doing is it's drawing the other weight of the font in the background so you can like compare uh, between fonts you can have the other font on the background so with these extension stuff you can do many uh, many custom things that may um, be influential to your workflow because some people might be working with uh, the neighbors or the background and some people may not and so you can install uh, functionality uh, depending on what you're doing. So it avoids like applications where you have hun uh, hundreds of uh, buttons and, and lots of lots of features that you, you may not need at all. So yeah, here we go.
Thanks.